and start recording. Okay, so we'll just get going, folks. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. My Wi-Fi is not too bad. Um, so first off, um, Elish and Emer, thank you very much for, for, for joining us. Um, as everyone knows, um, Emer is from Munster and Irish Road and, and they're from Adley Crove and uh, Fair Football as well. Um, they they both very both come from a, a GA background but are very very successful in rugby and the AFL and they've also had a a, a great stint um, over in, in, in New York um, with Nafina and they were also a, a New York GA co camp coach as well. But a fun fact that it comes up on a on a quiz or anything that there. So you just want to say hello Emer and Elish? Hi Mickey, how are you? Hi Mickey, how are you? Thanks for having us on. Great folks. Oh, thank you for coming on. Um so well, we've broken down the, the last few questions over the last week into themes, folks, and I'm just going to go through them um, over the over the next hour. Um, if you have any more questions, uh, um, and just double check every so often, make sure your microphone is, is on mute, because we had a few technical difficulties um, just last week once or twice, all right? Um, so just starting off on your and your personal journeys, um, Yelish anymore. Um, the, the first question we get sent in, um, can you just briefly talk about your your own player pathways, um, to your and your current sports, and if you can do a similar switch? I think our our journeys are pretty similar. For the start, um, we grew up kind of playing every sport under the sun. You know, we um we started off with athletics. And that was kind of a good base to start with. And then we started with Gaelic football. Being from West Clare, there isn't really many other sports apart from Gaelic football. So we started off playing with the boys to start with because there wasn't any girls team. Um, and then we just, I suppose, once we started playing for Clare under 14, under 16, we met a few girls who played camogie. And we ended up joining a local camogie team called Camelie Camogie. And um, then from there, we ended up on county teams. Uh, with me then, I suppose this is where it gets a bit different. I moved to Dublin and then I got scouted from the IRSU. They were looking at players from other sports. And I just got an email one day asking me would I be interested in playing sevens rugby because it was, they were trying to qualify for the Olympics in 2016 and it was a brand new sport. And I suppose rugby don't really have the, the pool of players that the GA or other sports would have. So they were picking players and a lot of our team actually was... Um, ex Gaelic footballers like there was Louis Ga Louise Galvin, there is Lisa Mulhall, our captain, Laura Walsh from Westmead. So a lot of the girls on the rugby team were past footballers. Um, so then from there, I played two, two years of sevens, which was semi pro. So it was kind of difficult today with work and with, you know, being semi pro, I was trying to do a full time job and then trying to play full time almost. And then I left the sevens program and then started playing 15 rugby. So I've been playing. It's my third season playing with the, the 15s team and currently that's where we're at. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, similar to what we had the same story with getting football and, and, and hurling and stuff. Um, like so, yeah, I guess I stuck at football and Mogi a bit longer than than Emer did. And um, I guess my opportunity with AFL came up in later years and in the last couple of years really well. Mike Coran set up a team um, called West Clare Waves. And his sister Rosie um, invited me and a couple of the girls um, here in Hillmore to go to the tournament that was on. And from there, I guess it was kind of um, a new challenge and a new sport and something that, you know, like we were all pretty good at because we had the basic skills of, of kicking and catching and that kind of thing. And we ended up winning nearly every tournament we played with West Clare Waves. And, um, I think my love of sport grew from there, and then um, the cross quarters opportunity came up, and I was very fortunate to actually pick for that, and you know got the opportunity to go with some trials in Melbourne. Um, you know, it was kind of a big, um, a big trip over, and really didn't expect to get much from it to be honest. Kind of going to Australia just to see it for the first time, and probably the last time in my eyes. But it turned out that Adelaide Coles showed a little bit of interest and, and offered me a contract on, on the Tuesday morning when I was there. So um, it was, yeah, you know, crazy. Um, I guess a year and a bit playing 
Europe with Europe, especially starting off in, in Ireland and, and playing European championships and then you know getting signed by you know the, the premiers of the previous year before. So um, didn't know much about Adelaide or the team or Australian football, but um, they took me under their wing literally and um, taught me all the skills and tried to make a player out of me and currently from there. So um, that's that was my kind of pathway to, to Adelaide Pools. Um, I think Creamy said that an early important bit there based on that picture. Um, that was the summer before Ailish got offered a contract and the summer before I went back playing rugby for Ireland. Um, and we won a New York title with Navina. So that was an important part in our part, part in our um, in our development. Well, it was a great season in New York. The first time back playing together in a couple of years because we had gone our separate ways between you playing rugby and and me playing football and come up to at home. So it was, it was nice to have the, the two of us back on the same field and the same code again for once. <laughs> I'm sure probably helped the, the yellow and blue jerseys as well. Probably made a nice transition from Claire to Nathena as well. Um, yeah, just on, just when we have you. Just when we have you, um, Ellis, could you take uh, just a few a few inches closer to the screen, just to start right, just for for the sound. Come a little bit closer, just for the sound quality. Yeah, no problem. Perfect. Um, and Ellis, just when you're talking about, we had a few questions and um on your personal journey. What was the hardest transition, um, moving to Australia out of the football? Um, I guess the hardest thing was probably. Picking up a brand new sport again, like you, it, like I, it wasn't really the move over because I think I was like just very excited about so, trying something new and the club were brilliant in terms of making me feel at home and stuff. So it wasn't really homesickness. That wasn't really the thing that you know got me the first year. It was more so just learning a whole new game all over again. When you know, not that you've ever perfected any sport or any skills or anything like that, but like you've played football all your life. You know, you know it inside out. You don't have to think about it ever. But I remember my very first training session with with Crows. Um, Phil Harper asked me. He was like, it was just after we did the conditioning, and he he asked me. He's like, oh, how did you find that? Like, what was your? I would say that was your least favorite part of training. And I remember actually saying to him, I said, like, actually that was the easiest part of training for me because it was the first time in the whole session I didn't have to think because I have to think. So much between executing the skill, executing everything that goes with it, learning a new game style, game plan, all that kind of thing that went with it. Because while they're similar in terms of skills, they're very different in how it's played. And Emer can say the same for rugby. It's very different game play and game style to play like football. So your head is just spinning. You're, you've no idea what's going on and you're trying to learn as much as possible in, in a short period of time. And I think that was probably the hardest thing. Trying to not think so much and actually play a little bit more on instinct and yeah, learning the game is quite difficult in, in the first while. So the, the running side of the, the easiest part and not, not a big runner. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of it anyway, but that was the easiest part of training. <laughs> um, Elish, Annie, what what is your um, biggest sporting achievement um, to date? I actually answered this question the other day and I it really took me a long time to kind of think of what was the one the one thing. Like when you've played so many sports at such high levels, you've had so many good moments, so many bad moments, but so many memorable ones as well. And so I kind of divided into two sections because like football is obviously my life and I grew up with it and I wouldn't be where I am without it. And and this year, well last year, last season, two thousand and nineteen, we ended up winning the county final with our club. The senior kind of final for the first time ever in the club's history and i know like to a lot of people you think representing your country is amazing and it's the best thing ever and some girls have grown up their whole lives wanting to represent ireland but i didn't grow up my whole life wanting to represent ireland at rugby like i was a gaelic footballer to start with and i think we dream to win a county final you dream to win all ireland when you grow up in west clare and we won the 2009 intermediate all ireland final that was pretty special so i was only 17 playing in all, all Ireland like I didn't really realize just how special it was at the time but I think from since 2010 we've been up senior as a club and in between then our club has folded as well so 
we both joined different clubs because we couldn't feel teams. So 10 years on after trying and losing six or seven, five or six county finals um, over those 10 years, we finally won won last year as complete underdogs and absolutely you know, played a ridiculous game that day and like were clear winners. And I think that was that was one of the most special moments, I think, because you grew up, and I'll say I'll, I'll the same thing, you grew up playing with those girls since you could kick a ball You've gone to school with them. You've lost. You've got hammerings with them, and then to win it finally was was pretty sweet. So that would be my my football one. But um, with rugby, I got to play. I was so lucky to play in a World Cup, a rugby World Cup, and the the double. I suppose the, what made it really good was it was in Ireland. It was in Dublin and in Belfast. So you played in a World Cup, which is something I suppose you don't really think about growing up in West Clare and then to play with again your friends and your family been able to be at it because it is in Ireland so um, I think they're my two they're my two best moments that I'm proud of I suppose in sport. Yeah I'm probably pretty similar as well especially with the, the kill number one with you know, the county final last year like it's obviously something we've tried so so hard to do and you know at some stage we actually stopped dreaming of it because we thought it was never going to happen and you know it, it finally did and we actually we broke through and, and finally won it and to this day I'm still I still really can't believe that we actually did it and like like I'd, I'd happily retire now from football it was just an absolute dream that that's what we did we, we won with Kilmahal and yeah it was it was pretty special and Obviously, I'm going to break it up into two like Eimear did as well, like because you know football is a big chunk of our sporting career. So, but I guess um, you can't really look past winning a, winning the grand final in your first season with with Adelaide Crows in the AFL. Like, like what an experience! Like we we filled it, we filled Adelaide over fifty three thousand people showed up to watch us play in the grand final against Carlton, and it was an absolute dream come true. Like you, you couldn't you couldn't write it like first season of AFL, like I didn't expect to even get a single minute on the field, not to talk about a play in a grand final and, and kick a goal and, and witness that crowd. It was just, it was something so special. And then having Emer Keith and Mam there and seeing the Irish flag in the middle of Adelaide Oval was, was something that I'll never forget. And it's been my greatest memory with sport so far. Um, so yeah, they're probably my two at the moment. So 2019 was a pretty, pretty special year. Brilliant. Um, just that brings us nice on, nicely on to the to next next sort of theme is just on coaching. So you both sort of talked about having a lot of success in, in, in both both sports. Um, but who was your most um, and this can be Gaelic Gaelic football or it can be um, AFL rugby. But who was your most influential coach throughout your playing career and what qualities did they possess that made them special? Um. I'll jump in first with this one. Um, like I've had a lot of great coaches over the years and very different personalities and, and that kind of thing. And even with AFL, like you can't look, look past Matthew Clark, our coach, like he's incredibly so calm. But I'm gonna go with um Fiona McHale, um as probably someone that really opened my eyes into just, you know, a different style of training and someone that was just so measured and calculated in her in her method of training. And um I guess I'm very grateful towards her because I also was coming back from my ACL um, when I went back to university and, and was playing with um, UL. So it was kind of at a stage where it was kind of really hit or miss with my knee. It would have really taken me a long time to get back and, and rehab it correctly. And especially at that time of year, I wouldn't have really done much of training. So she really like helped me get back physically to where I needed to be and obviously the standard of university football in, in like with UL is it's crazy high, it's crazy good. So, you know, she really um pushed us as, as a team. She was hard but she was fair and I think that was a quality that I, I love in, in all managers. Anyone that's you know can be really hard on you but it's fair at the end of the day to everyone it's the same to everyone else. I think treating everyone with the same respect and, and same regard is is something that she brought and she had such a you know such a good name behind her as well. Like she was a great player herself, and you know, you had almost a respect for her. And anything she said, you do, and you do anything for her. And you know, a type of manager that kind of gets you to do things like the kind of trainer that gets you to do that it is someone that's you know really has a big impact on on you. And I think I've definitely 
you know, improved a lot under her and, you know, she had a, a really good way about her in terms of, you know, being hard and fair, but like her trainings were extremely hard. She did lots of running. She got a super fit, but behind it all, she had a great football mind as well. So, you know, you were always learning and, you know, getting fitter at the same time. So um, definitely she was one of, one of the best coaches I've ever had. Um, I think it was David O'Brien from Millsounds with Dob. He would have been my first county senior football coach and I was only 16 when I joined that team so he just kind of brought me to a level that I never knew that I had in relation to like in everything really with the professionalism that was there at the time back in 2008 2009 where you know I didn't know what an S&C program was but he was the first person that kind of introduced to that um he had nutritionists in he had psychologists in I remember my first year so he gave me like the foundations of progression with sport from a very young age like from the age of 16 I knew what it was to train hard and what high standards were and like that again I think fairness I think every woman's treat is the same and he gave equal opportunities like I was a 16 year old who had to earn everything that I like got and he gave me that chance as well so him from the start he was a great coach to have to kind of give me that base in hard training sessions and and the level of professionalism that he brought so long ago like it was 11 12 years ago um then with our current coach Adam Grace he's I really like the way he does his processes and stuff and his one of his models is you know if you if you do something 100 percent, it won't be the wrong decision and i think that i think that links back to like football and any really any sport really you know if you're if you're going to tackle someone do it you know with 100 percent, and you won't miss or if you're going to if you're in two minds whether you should pass the ball or carry the ball and then you're going to do both wrong or you're going to fumble the ball or you're knock it on in contact because you're not bracing yourself for the carry um, but if you just decide, look, I'm making that carry or I'm going to pass, at least you're going to do that 100%. And generally, if you do something, you know, 100%, it's the same in hurling. If you pull out of a tackle, if you pull out of the pull, you're going to get hurt. So I think that's the one really good piece of advice that he, he gives us. And I think it, it's really benefited me since I've come back under him, since I came back from a year away from it, um, is that he kind of backs you in your decision. And if you think it's the correct decision, he'll back you all the way. And I suppose it gives you the confidence as a player and it puts confidence in you to, to back yourself and make decisions. And you're not afraid to make mistakes because you know, look, if I do my best, that's as much as I can do. So um, that's our current coach, Adam Griggs. Brilliant. That's, that's, that's fantastic, Eli Seymour. And um, we'll just, we'll go, we'll go with Eimear first, this one, just so we're going a bit of a back, back and forth. So um, at what age, with this question, what age do you think coaches can focus and should focus on bringing about success, so win games um, as well as developing players. It's, I, I've had a lot of kind of discussions in my head about this one. What's the right answer? And I'm sure there's a lot of people who will disagree with the answer. But I think from under 12, I think there needs to be a little bit of a competitive edge. Um, I suppose depending on what, what age they start playing at, you know, they're going to have the basic fundamental skills developed at that stage. And I think once you have the skills developed, you can start building on the competitive side. You can start. Um, building on that you know I think to get to a certain level you have to be competitive and I just I think competition is important it, it drives you to be better it drives you not only it's not just about winning you know competition is about being better than the person next to you whether it's being the best striker of a ball whether it's being the fastest person to get to a cone whether it's um, being the best off two feet so I think com competition is absolutely it's so important um, no matter what age you are because it gives you the drive that you need to be a high level athlete whether it's playing for your county whether it's playing rugby for ireland you know i think the competitive edge is the key um to the difference between people who don't make it and people who do make it yeah like i'm pretty much the same opinion i think up to under 12 it's enough time for them to you know learn their basic fundamentals learn the game and that kind of thing I think after that you kind of need to push on towards competition because that's the only way really you're going to improve and, and see improvements is when you know you introduce the winning and losing and things and look I've probably lost more games than I've won but you know they, every single game that I've lost it stood to me like I've probably learned more from losing than I have from winning so um, like it's definitely something that you need to strive for you need to strive to win because otherwise you'll stay at the same level over and over again and, and look it's not even just a sporting thing it's a life lesson in life you win and you lose and if you don't learn how to manage that or cope with that in sport you won't be able to cope with that in life either so I think it was a good learning curve for us especially being from Kilmahal we didn't win too many things underage especially and even from Claire we didn't win too many things either so 
look, it's a, it's a good lesson to learn, and you know, it makes the the wins all that bit sweeter when you do actually get there. So, um, yeah, definitely, competition should be brought in. I think after under twelve and, and from there on. Yeah, I think it's both made two brilliant points just by getting your your skill development right first, and um, you know, making things about competition, not necessarily winning, but definitely about competition. But yeah, that's like that's, that's a brilliant answer, um, Eilish and Neymar. Um, this next one, so if I go with Eilish first, uh, the this question is about uh, bringing in um, how to create a winning team culture. I'm um, Eilish, and the term thrown around, thrown around uh, quite a lot um, over the last number of years, but I suppose. With successful teams, what values and behaviours do they they bring in that made them so successful? Yeah, like I think a major thing, especially with Adelaide Crows, is that you know everything is team first. It's it's not about the individuals. And yes, there's individual stars on our team. That there's absolutely like you know you've got the best in the league, Air Phillips on our team. You've got you know Anne Hatcher, Ebony Marinoff, all these players that are well known in like in AFLW circles and. But like at the end of the day, it's all about the team and how they perform and how you do your role because everyone has a set role and once that's achieved, then the team will perform like overly well. And I think another thing that they're really focused on, especially I noticed with the year we won the Premiership, is that you know it was there was just genuine care for people within the club, genuine care and respect, and you know not just been there as a teammate but been there as a friend as well and I think that's that's a major thing that you you know you have to get on and, you know you don't always get on with every single person or teammate on your team but I think making that genuine effort to you know ask how someone is or you know become an, an actual friend rather than just a teammate and I think that was definitely something um from last year that was incredible because like they made me complete home or it made me feel like home in, a, in another country so they succeeded in that but they just yeah the ethos they have at the club is it's all about the person and like if you're a super talented person but not someone that likes to follow a team ethos crows won't sign you and like that's probably a good thing for them it's very similar to the all black ethos you know if you're a good person and a good player you go a long way with crows but if you're if you decide not to be a good person you're not going to last too long in in the club so that's a very important thing to them and i think that's that's something that has definitely shown to them. They've won two premierships out of three, so two out of three in bad so far. And obviously, no winner this year. So, I think they're definitely having in, in the right way it should be. Like players, personality, stuff are important, and, and how much work they put in for others. Is something that's that's huge, and it's not an individual sport for a reason. It's a team sport, so everything works well, much better together when when you play as a team and, and you know work as a team. Yeah, I think, um, I know Ireland women's rugby haven't won much since I've been involved with us, but I've seen a clear difference in the last few years, especially this year. Um, obviously, we were disappointed with how we ended last year and we made a lot of changes in relation, just I suppose in relation to culture. Culture is probably one of the most important things on a team. Um, and like Ayla said, it's about getting to know the people. And we've had a lot more contact time with each other since we've had our new high performance centre out in Blanchestown. We train there all the time. We have a set base and it's ours. And... Um, going back to like the way we play, we have set systems and that's the way we play and nobody kind of, obviously there is a magic in games, of course, tries, but generally 99% of the time you can stick to the system and everyone has their roles and I suppose knowing the system and knowing your role is key, especially with rugby, you know, everything is very much set play. Everyone knows right down to who's in that ruck, who should be there and if they're not there, you know, you can pick it out straight away. So I think it's the clarity in your job and in your roles and it's a team focus because if one person it doesn't matter if, who you are if you aren't doing the system your team is going to suffer so it's really just a team ethos that we have at the moment and this year six nations even though it got cut short it was definitely one of the better ones and we were on the right track you know we were really optimistic after that english performance going into that italian game um and especially went into the french game as well you know we were really hopeful of two wins there and um, with the way we had been playing and i think with Kilmahill last year, obviously we'd lost quite a few county finals and like the year prior, prior to that, I was in Australia traveling and Ailish was um, actually in Australia. I think she was um, in her trial for the Adelaide Crows actually and she missed the county finals. The two of us weren't 
around and they lost the county final by what, like 18 points, 19 points? Yeah. I'm not sure the exact number, but they, the year previous they'd lost. They, that year, last, in 2019, we had got relegated from the league. So, like, we didn't have a lot of belief. But I think for the for the first year ever, we had belief in our team. Um, and I think we believed we were going to win. You know, we were... So, I suppose, just knowing that you... The work zone, knowing that you have a great team around you. And um, Ailish will add more to this, I'm sure. But, like, you actually focused on on us and not the team, not the opposition for once in in our lives. Yeah, so like normally when we would be going out in a county final, we'd be focusing on the other team and what they bring and, you know, your attitude towards them and towards players and stuff like that. Whereas I think this year, for a change, we actually went out and, you know, we did it for ourselves. We did it for the love of our team, the love of our parish, you know, our family. We did it for the likes of them. So we kind of, we didn't go in with a hatred. Like we normally would have, you know, going into a game when you're coming up against a team that you don't necessarily like. You're like, oh, I hate this team. I'm going to do this, whatever. But we actually went in with a completely calm attitude and saying, look, we've done the other way long enough. It hasn't worked. We're going to do this for ourselves. And we're the ones that are going to benefit from this. So it was it was a big mindset change. And I think that was definitely something that, you know, felt very different in the in the dressing room even beforehand and even at half time there was just a sense of calm around the girls because there was never that fear of hating them it was you know just we're doing this for us let's just keep doing it and i think that was that was a huge change for us and it was you know um incredible feeling to actually achieve it at the end of the day and i think you know sometimes changing your mindset can be all you need to do to you know um get over the line yeah I think the change in mindset as well linked in with the process. Like we had a process, we had a system, and everyone knew their roles in that. And if so, if A happened, you did this. But if B happened, you did this. And then, like even when we scored, you if we watched Ailish and I actually watched this back. We watched the county final back last week, um, and like when we scored, we didn't celebrate. We just got back out and did our next job. And it was like, I suppose with the banner with teams like that you always think they're going to score a goal straight away after you score yeah. a goal. So you, your next job is, you can't celebrate, you have to just get back and focus on the next job, which is defend the kickouts. And we didn't celebrate until the very end of the game because you always thought, you know, they might come back, they might come back. Um, and I think it was focusing on the process. Um, so similar to the rugby as well, I think there, there can be processes in, in every game. And I think once people know the, the game plan and they do their role in that job, um, their role in that, in that plan, they'll be really successful. Yeah, exactly. Like we focus on the process, not the outcome. And I think we got the process 100% on the day. And likewise for Adelaide last year, we got the process right a lot of the time. So the result took care of itself. So like when you've got the work done, when you follow the systems and when you go out, you know, the correct mindset, the result will follow no matter what. So I think that was definitely a huge help to come home for us winning that kind of final last year. That's 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 first class. I think with any with any coach's lesson, you know, sometimes you get overthinking in, in terms of what drills to do and exercises and and tactics. But you know, as you both sort of saying there, it's about you know performing to the best of your ability and let the let the one and let the one and the goals come, and more about working about the worrying about the player rather than the rather than the sport. Now that's 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 first class. Um, Elish Nimmer, we're just going to move on to the to the next theme. Um, and if anybody's any any questions or anything sparks, um, please feel free to write them in the comment section on the right hand side. Um, so uh, we're gonna go, we'll go to Emer first for this question. So we always always had a lot of questions in about your your current sports. Um, but our first question is, um, Emer, is there anything different um, from the AFL or rugby that we could bring in into the GA that comes to mind? So this could be anything like a process or a something like a, a training drill or a certain structure, anything at all? I think um, the main difference, like I think the GEA's blueprint is based off professional teams like rugby or like the AFL. So I think in relation to like nutrition, like um, your s &C, your physio, your management, your, your drills, I think they're very much, the GEA has absolutely increased its level of professionalism, even as an amateur sport. But I think the one thing that I notice on Ailish is the same, um, is the recovery and is the, the the, I suppose the amount of training that we do, like everything we do is monitored. So 
in our off season we have our GPS data with us that we put in our put in the back of us and it tracks your running and um, we have our live GPS guy with us on the pitch so they can see how much meters are running um, and they'll pull you if you're doing too much or something like that. Um, so over the weekend we would do a lot like obviously we're we're completely amateur even though we train probably just as much as the rest of them do but we train Friday, Saturday, Sunday so we would do one pitch session on a Friday in a gym, two sessions on a Saturday and two on a Sunday. So your load was really difficult. Um, it was an awful amount of running on the weekends, but it's all monitored and every drill has a set target on it and has a set amount of Ks they want and has a set amount of high speed running that they have on it. So that if you hit it, they can pull the drill short. Um, and then similarly, like our weeks would be very much, you know, um, our Monday would be recovery day, Tuesday is just a gym day. Wednesday is an off-beat session and then you're back in off Thursday, back in Friday, Saturday, Sunday, heavy. So it's the load management, I think. And there's such a focus on recovery with us that I wouldn't have known about, you know, in the GA. Like we're always told you need to put your compression skins on your legs after training. Um, you need to, you know, use your game ready, which is like an ice machine, go into the ice baths with hot cold treatments. You know, we have all the facilities available. And I think when I played GA, I was playing Camogie and football to clear and you probably you go from a football training to a camogie session um, and then you might play two games, one on a Saturday, one on a Sunday. So your load management and you were like you're almost getting burned out and you weren't giving the best to either team because you had played too much or you trained too much in the week. So I think um I think the load management is one thing that definitely I think it's improving, but obviously, you know, it's the it's the teams that have the most amount of money that can afford the GPS systems and that and I don't know it's, it's probably coming down eventually and it'll get there to every team but not it's not readily available I suppose to every to every team. Yeah so we're obviously the same with the professional side of things having all of those like within the club under one roof and yeah like, like what you were saying like the monitoring is just crazy like you know you have a set amount of K's and high speed running and all that kind of thing to do in a session or even in a week and you know, if you're under that, then the conditioning level gets raised at the end of training. If you're above that, then the conditioning gets lowered at the end of training. So, like, it's it's so monitored and it's so individual and personalised. And, like, even players that have done too many Ks in a session get pulled out and get told to go upstairs and start the recovery. Because they're just, they're so monitoring every single individual thing that you do in training. And, you know, it makes a lot of difference in professional sport. Like, that is the major difference between amateurs and professionals. You have to and the time and everything to you know recover properly and get ready for the next training session whenever that may be so um the recovery has been definitely a major change for, for me and definitely something that the GA should really look into because you know you're you talk about us and we used to play football and come over we, we literally trained every night of the week between the two sports when we were playing both and I talk about burnout. I, I don't know how we actually survived as long as we did without, you know, any major serious injuries. Like if I had one, but like we've been, we've been quite lucky with injuries and and actually surviving to play both sports for so long. But like it really, like it, it majorly affected you. You did get burnout, um, and it ended up that you were playing rugby at the time. But like it's. It can get a lot, especially with the GA fixtures and the calendar, because it runs so long between November and you would start your preseason in November and you run all the way through September when your club finishes up. So like it is a long season, so recovery just has to be something that just has to give within the season. It has to be included, and I think it'll definitely bring the game to the next level and bring players to the next level. And um, it's definitely something that has helped me, and it's definitely helped you. Um, yeah reduce injuries, get stronger, get faster, get fitter, you know, improve your your time and runs and all that kind of thing. Like I've my levels from the last year and a half, two years have, have jumped crazy. My yo yo tests have gone way up, my my strength tests have gone way up. So it just shows that with a bit of, you know, like looking into recovery and, and being specific to, to your own needs and to a team, you can, you know, make huge improvements and, you know, yeah. make I think that's another thing as well that obviously rugby is very position specific um, and we get all different gym programs based on what position you're in so like the battery we work on like a lot of plyos and stuff so we work on your explosivity and your you know your sprint and your sprint mechanics and that whereas the front three the front row would 
would work on maybe, you know, their scrummaging technique, but it would be through their gym sessions, through band work and through their like extras. So kind of it's all really individualized. I know Gaelic football, obviously, a lot of the players are of similar physique, but, you know, like they, they could have different gym programs for a goalkeeper who needs to work on his, you know, plyometrics for, for diving or there needs to be different um like gym program for maybe a midfielder he needs to work on his CMJ because he needs to jump higher. So I think even individualizing those programs is something that we do that might be beneficial um in the GA depending on I suppose the amount of K's like a wing back picks up or the amount of like what what's the difference in a wing back and a full back and then spe- and then do specific gym programs based on them. Um another thing we do is our coaches actually either release us or don't release us for club games depending on the amount of minutes that we've played either in the weekend or depending on our injury so if you're coming back from an injury they will not release you to play club football which are club rugby which you know it's good and bad it takes it means you're, you're getting time to recover and you're not under pressure yourself to say look because obviously you're under pressure if you want to play club you want to play club they want you to play club but by the hour you make the decision they're taking the decision out of your hands and you're just saying look I'm I'm not available to play, which again is the which is the rest and the recovery that you need to you know, there's no point going back to think from an injury. Um, so it's like the recovery in that 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 they're really, really monitor. Yeah, especially for injuries. Like they'll they'll never let you out for a full training session when you say you're okay. They'll always like ease you back in. They'll do certain they'll do a specific session for you to do within while the rest of the girls are out there training, then that's all you can do. Once you've done that, you're pulled out. That's it. No matter how good or bad you feel, that's that's it. So like it's it's so structured and so monitored that it's just it's just the way it should be. Whereas I think in, in Gaelic football sessions, sometimes you can have the sense of false like security, thinking that you're actually okay and you'll keep going. And the manager will ask you how you're feeling. You're like, I'm fine. Yeah, feel fine. And then you keep going, and then you know, the twinge. So it's it's so. Like they have all the facilities and all the personnel needed to, to do all that. Like they have all the strength trainers there and the physios to, to pull you out and that kind of thing to monitor it. So I guess numbers is always good and finance is always makes that easier. And I know yeah. the GA is to manager, but it definitely makes a difference. When you're yeah, like I, I tore my calf at the very first week of January, um, just ahead of the Six Nations, or ahead of, last week of January, ahead of the Six Nations. And I had to like go through stages of it, but he wouldn't let me back in the field until I did a strength test until my two calves were equal. So, you know, like to have, it's again, it's money, it's the facilities that we had in relation to be able to do those strength tests. Um, but it's the monitoring and it, it meant that I had to get to a certain amount of strength before I was able to get back in the field, which isn't always available in the GAA. You know, you just base it on how you feel, which isn't always accurate. No, especially when you get to it. But, but I think they're two two great points, especially over you know quality training over over I suppose quantity training and when and even time back your last point, Eilish. But when you are getting that time to recover, I suppose it, it, the coach is showing that you know he cares about you as a player rather than just as a you know as a as a competitor as well. Um, uh, Eilish, we'll just we'll go to you first one for this question. Um, so for both of you, how did you manage the transition um, from GA um, into um, a new sport? Yeah, um, I guess it was quite hard at the start, like especially because, you know, um, I guess for me, and pretty much similar to Ema when she took up rugby, the first thing we kind of focused on was actually getting the skill fundamentals of the game, what we needed to do. So basically just going to do all the kicking, do the handball and catch and learn how to play with the over ball, all those kind of things. Like, so I just spent hours and hours and hours just perfecting them and trying to get them as good as possible before actually going out onto the track and training. So that was kind of the first process really of how, how we started off. And then the next thing then was kind of just looking at general gameplay videos, um, just watching the game, getting to see how, how it was played and, and how to follow it and, you know, just where the ball goes and where everyone follows it and just, just getting a rough idea of how it's played. And then I guess the kind of next thing was kind of looking at individuals and individual positioning and the players and, and how they played and how the position works and where they're supposed to be, where they're supposed to go and all that kind of thing. So it very much started very broad in terms of learning the skills and trying to get them as good as possible. And then once you've done all that, then you're just thrown the deep end, you're straight into training and then you're with girls that have, have played the sport 
potentially all their lives or have been playing, you know, professionally the last two, three years. So you're kind of just thrown in there and just see how you do. And um, But look, that's that's how you learn. You, you know, you have to put yourself under pressure in those situations and that's going to get improve. So um, it's still one of the hardest things to get is, you know, the game sense and, and the positioning side of things and, and learning the structures. It's, it's the hardest thing to, to get from the game. And, and it's the, the only, the worst thing about it is you can't, Track that, like you can fast track skills by practicing and practicing over and over again. Like you can do them for hours and get super good at them. But at the end of the day, you need actual game time and training time to actually get better at, you know, learning read to read, to read the flight of the ball and learning how to read the game and all that kind of thing. So it's still a work in progress. I can definitely tell you that I do not know how to read the game fully. Like I'm. I get into positions either too early or too late, and that's, that's a learning curve for me. And it's definitely something that I'll keep continuing to work on, and we'll work on for the next season and next couple of seasons, hopefully. So I'm sure Emer has a similar story as to how she turned it off. Oh yeah, like it was it was awful. Like I, it was so hard to start, and I think the hardest part was coming from a sport that you were just naturally good at. Like you grew up yeah. with the football in your hand, and like the gameplay of football and Camogie is very similar. Like if you can read one, you can read the other. And Oh, it's so hard. Like I, I cried for a lot of the sessions, you know, because you were just so crap, and like people are you're coming, from, and... you're coming from a sport that you have, like, literally would know in your sleep. Like you know it off the back of your hand. You don't have to think about it at all, and then you're thrown into the deep end into a brand new sport where you know nothing about it. Yeah, and like it's easy to the skills. Like it was really easy to pass the ball. Like you know, we were athletic. We probably played with a rubber ball at home before, and passing was like really easy we did it in isolation for the first few weeks and then we do a bit of running and you did your passing your kick and your, you were hitting tackle bags which aren't realistic to real people that move and like Gail said you are just thrown into the thing like I was practicing probably for three months in isolation but then when you went into a game I was thrown into the Irish squad straight into that and in one way, I'm thankful that I got thrown in at such a high level because I didn't learn any bad skills. I didn't learn any bad habits. I was taught from the best coaches, by the best coaches, the best way to do things. So in one way, I'm really thankful about that. But it was really hard because you're thrown into an Irish squad. And my first game was against Canada in San Diego. We played USA and Canada in San Diego in a three-way tournament. And I had never tackled someone before in a real life. I'd only done it like a tackle bag. I'd never like played a real game. He told me to go scrum half at one stage and I didn't know how to put the ball into the scrum. Like I had no clue of the game. Even though we were rugby fans, I grew up watching rugby. It is so technical and the more the more I watch it, the more I realise, you know, that they did that there, they did that there. And it's it's the hardest part is to like Ayla said, it's understanding the game because yeah, I can catch the ball, yeah, yeah, I can run, yeah, I can hand off, but like it's completely when it comes to the actual spotting, you know, where the defence is, spotting the way the edge team plays, attack, how they attack, how they defend, and how you're going to combat the way they attack or the way they defend, you know, it's it's completely different to anything. But then it's really funny because when we went back to football, like, I hadn't planned on going back last summer. I actually had been travelling and it got cut short and, like, it was back in time. But, like, the minute you switch back in, it's like you've never left. Okay, your kicking is bad. My kicking was really bad when we went back to football. It's so zealous. But, like... After two, three weeks of practicing here, you're right back. Like it's like you never lose it, and I just wish that I could get rugby as as much as I get, as I get football. Um, and like even doing the World Cup analysis last year with with Air Sport, you know, like I was still very much learning um how to analyze games, and then I think read that really benefited me. You know, watching world class teams play, and listening to the likes of Jerry Flannery and Tommy Bow and Brian Darcy, Peter Stringer, talk about rugby made me understand so much more about it. So the only way to get better is by watching it and sitting down and analysing it and watching the best players and how they play. Like when I first started, it was Keith Earls. I was like, I want to be as good as Keith Earls. So I'm going to watch him now. I'm a fullback. So um, I watch Darren Larmer. I watch equivalent really good fullbacks, you know. So um, it's just about studying and it's it's a holy ball game. Um, Emma, we'll go to we'll we'll, just, we'll touch on this next um, question on the theme. Um, did you find playing multiple sports um, helped you throughout your career? So you played uh, soccer, volleyball, athletics, um, as as well as GA. Did it did it come in useful when you uh, made the transition to rugby? Yeah, I absolutely think it did. Um, 
<coughs> I think just playing that meant sports in general <coughs> benefited me, you know. Um, I think if you pick one, if you early specialize in one sport, you know, you're going to stick with those skills and you're going to narrow the skills that you have. <coughs> Sorry. You just go on there and go on to the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think doing so many sports when we were younger, like definitely, you know, brought in so many different skills between hand-eye coordination with, you know, hurling, kicking with football, athletics, just learning the technique of how to run and, you know, get that right from an early age. I think definitely the best thing we ever did was having the two of us at home and practicing with every single piece of equipment that we could find. Like literally when Wimbledon was on, we'd pretend we were playing Wimbledon and we'd hit tennis balls over and back. So like, we were just always picking up a new sport between volleyball, soccer, like whatever it was, baseball, we even when our dad would come home from America and bring us home baseball gloves and a bat and whatever, anything, whatever it was, we just, we took our hand up with it and we started playing it and made up our own games and everything. And I think the more you do that as a child, the more skills you're going to gain. And I think you was probably going to say it, but like the way we didn't do early specialization, we, you know, we didn't go into one sport to get it from a really young age. We didn't really pick a sport really until we were about 15, 16 and we, we really specialise then to come home your football. And I think, again, even though they're quite similar sports, you still have two kind of different skill sets. You have a lot of kicking, a lot of catching with football, and then you've got lots of hand-like coordination and, and you know, movement with Komogi. So I think we were still very lucky with the two sports that we did pick. And then, obviously, later on, then we, we specialised again because, it, you know, it gets a lot to handle when you're playing multiple sports. And you do have to specialise if you want to, you know, become really good at one sport. And she picked rugby, and then I eventually picked... Um, Australian football so like we specialised quite late and I think that was a huge advantage to us and to where we ended up today and you want to add more yeah no I that's everything um I love like I'm a PE teacher so I love the development of like you know watching the fundamentals be developed and I think you know fundamentals we were so lucky like as I'm teaching 13 14 15 year old girls right now a lot of them can't jump properly or throw properly or strike a ball properly but i think we were taught the fundamentals and they're so so important that they should be taught at five six seven eight people should be able to run throw jump and not just in isolation like doing games that allow you to strike to catch to jump to run and i think we did it unknown to ourselves you know by making up games by paint cans on the a timber that we used to jump over as our hurdles you know we we just made up stuff and i think that's just so important. And um, I'm really interested, I'm not sure if you've read the, the book called Range, and it basically just talks about the difference between specialising young and 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 um, late specialisation, or just doing a variety of sports. And it's really interesting as well, and I suppose we are proof that playing multiple sports will benefit you. Um, and I suppose it makes you enjoy it as well. Like I didn't have a favourite sport growing up because we played, we played it all. And I think had I focused on rugby from the age of 12 I wouldn't have developed a lot because as a winger in rugby you probably get the ball two three four times in a game whereas you know by playing multiple sports and then eventually specializing in rugby you know I developed a lot of other things so I'm glad I didn't develop start playing rugby at a young age because you probably would end up disliking the sport because you have to succeed in that sport whereas I never saw myself playing rugby you know I just played sports for fun and I I had to choose between athletics and GA when I was around 16 because I ran with the junior club and I would have had to have changed clubs and I wasn't that serious about it so I just focused on the GA but um, I think I think it benefited us and, and I think it would benefit a lot of people just to do a lot of sports and not focus so so young. Um, I just I just like to agree there because um, they were Ailish and were both very very good in cool camp and making up games so what came from uh, I came from a young age, so there you go. If you want to be a coach as well, multi sport um, can help you make good games for Cole Camp and, and being a coach as well. So just want to touch on that. Um, we'll just touch on game day um, uh, preparation. Um, we'll give him an hour go, um, Ailish, just because she was coughing the first time. <laughs> That's all right. Um, Imer, have you, have you any um, game, uh, game day uh, superstitions or, or routines that you do? I used to have so many when it, I was playing GA, like I had to have porridge in the morning. Um, I had to, mum used to make us like a chicken sandwich on the way to games. Then she used to dose us in holy water before we went to games. And like there was one time she even ran out onto the field because we hadn't put it on us before the game. But supposedly it stopped us getting injured. Um, in fairness, it worked for the majority of the time. But um, I think with rugby, 
and it'll be similar to what I'll explain. It's completely new. Like it will, I never had a routine, you know. I um, I'll still eat my porridge every single match day, and the carb loading I have never seen anything like it before. Rugby, like our nutritionist, has literally tells us to eat and eat and eat carbs and gives us license to eat as much as we want beforehand. Um, so I think in relation to like nutrition and hydration, I focus more on my nutrition and hydration because obviously we have a nutritionist in place. Um, and then I suppose there's the captain's run and like all the hype that goes around that and the jersey presentation, you know. So with rugby, as with the Gaelic football, you probably trained on a Friday night and it was a real life kick around. You just had your team named and it was a team talk and there was no way you trained on a Saturday before a game on a Sunday. Whereas we do our captain's run the day before and and then there's the jersey presentation which is always really special because there's a special guest that comes in and presents the jersey in front of the whole squad um, and then you, you stand up you clap if it's your first half you know it's an even even more special occasion um so i think there's a lot of things that differ between rugby and and football and um my preparations have differed as well because i suppose it's a whole new type of preparation for me um, but I suppose the main thing with your nutrition and your hydration is still really important in both sports um, uh, and I just don't have the holy water I think that's it yeah mine is kind of similar um, I would have had a lot of like different um, traditions going into Gaelic football especially when I was younger I kind of started to wean them out a little bit as I got older um, but yeah with the AFL, because there was no routine going up um, it was all new and because I was away from home, um, everything was so different. So there wasn't really any set routine that I could really follow. Um, like the only thing that I would normally do before, what I did before every game was that I'd have protein pancakes the morning of the game. And if that turned out that it didn't work out because we were away, because, you know, we'd fly the day before a game, um, I'd have protein pancakes just before I leave, before I leave to the airport. So that's probably the only routine that I kind of followed and, Maybe on game day, if we had a, you know quite a lot of time in the morning, if we were away, I'd go for a walk, go for a long walk in the morning. But like literally, it's just focusing on nutrition and hydration and making sure that, that the body is fueled for the game. And other than that, um, hope for the best. Um, Elias, just on um, match day preparations um, and in terms of atmosphere, what, what were the main, main differences and is there any similarities? Yeah, um, not too many similarities, um, I must say. Um, from years of GA, like I've had lots of different personalities of managers. Lots of them have been, you know, very vocal and very passionate. Um, and you know, you, you get very hyped up in the dressing room with GAA. It tends to be, you know, you're going out ready for battle, and that's it. Then there's hurley's been broken. There's cones flying, <laughs> and all those this in the dressing room. So it was very different coming into. Sadly, because it's just it's such a relaxed environment. If you're you're in there like Doc. He's he's the most calm man I've ever met in my life, and he's handling a group of thirty women, and he does an absolutely brilliant job. And it's not an easy task by any means. And like the dressing room, it's like a mini disco before you go out into a game. There's music there, and people are dancing along, and they're doing their band work, to music, and they're bobbing along. It's just it's so calm and so relaxed. And you know, you're out there to actually enjoy it like everyone knows the work you've done like you've the preseason done you've everything done that you need to do you've done all the prep work in terms of structure so you're just ready to go and you're you're just raring to go because i think the thing with the AFLW season is that you've such a long break in between like it's a six month break where you've done football and the girls are just so keen to get out there that they're absolutely buzzing to get out playing and they're just dancing around having fun and it's all about having fun and you know and getting out there onto the field, and that's a very different, um, very different dressing room to what you know you'd be used to in GAA, where it's it's so tense, so serious. Um, you know, it means everything, and it's just it, it's yeah, it's such a strange comparison between the two, and it's definitely something that I find really good because some people like to be calm before a game, some people like to be hyped before a game, and it's very individualized. And I think with the way the Crows have done it. You can be whatever you want to be for a game and whatever suits you. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very different. <laughs> um, Emer, and anything, anything to add? Just the main differences between game day and uh, game day for rugby compared to the GA? 
I think in relation to just playing playing for Ireland, you know, it, it wouldn't be different with your club, but I suppose you're putting on an Irish jersey. That's a huge honour. And then there's the national anthem, which, you know, it wouldn't happen with Munster. It wouldn't happen with your club. It wouldn't happen um, playing a normal club football game, you know, but every single time you put on the Irish jersey, you sing the national anthem. And I don't think anyone can explain the, like, the pride you have when that happens. And, like, you literally are going out to battle. Like, rugby is like a battlefield. And, it's getting you like the emotions are they're crazy, you know, in the in the dressing room beforehand, the passion our our captain junior Kira Griffin, she is phenomenal. And the emotion and passion that she has, you know, it just it makes you realise you're representing your country and I think there's there's not many things that are much more special than that. Um I think you have to realise that every time you, you go out onto the pitch. Emer Elias has been brilliant, really brilliant so far. So we're just in the last theme here now. So we've talked about short term preparation and just on like long term and, and the and the pre season fitness um element. Um Emer, what's what would you what would you say is the best pre season um drill or exercise to get you up the um match fitness? Uh, as much as I absolutely hate it, it's it's running. Like personally for me, running gets me fit. Like I can do as many bike sessions or rowing sessions or whatever offbeat sessions as possible, and I just don't feel the benefit of it. So like I've noticed the last few weeks as well, we've been doing a lot of on feet conditioning, and our runs are mixed between some hundred meter runs, some fifty meters of turn, some like eight hundred, nine hundred meters, and then some long runs thrown in there as well. So I think running with a variety like there's no point in the same five k loop over and over again you know it won't benefit you you know you have to get a bit of aerobic anaerobic in to work both systems and um there's no easy way like there's no easy way to get fit i think you just have to run and and run and i don't know what the sailors think but i i personally get fit from running and um and the change up of what i do and not just keep it the same boring run all the time yeah um Look, at the end of the day, you have to run after the ball and that's like after it. So it's very specific to what you need to do. And unfortunately, it is running is the only way to actually get up to that match fitness and improve, you know, your own aerobic capacity. So it's, yeah, unfortunately, it's not the easiest thing to do, especially in isolation at the moment. It's, it's not easy to go out and run yourself like we would have all chosen to be an individual athletes if that was the case, but we, we chose our team for it. So it's we find it easier to do it together. But, um, yeah, running, and I think another thing as well, um, just keeping a continuous gym program. I think a lot of a lot of teams and people make the mistake of their gym program, you know, for a certain amount of time of the year, and then come competition, come the end of the competition, you stop completely, and you lose more, more, a lot quicker than you gain. And I think having a consistent gym program throughout the year, whether it's season or you know, prep or preseason, you know, it doesn't really matter. I think keeping that gym consistent and, and constantly working and maintaining what you've gained in, in the last year is something that's, you know, become incredibly important in the game and the way it's gone. And like, you'll, you'll see the results and like, and if you don't see, you'll see the results, you know, the amount of time that you're playing, you're going to be less injured. So, um, they're definitely the two things that, you know, we do have to get game ready because you're injury camp at the time. So, you know, if you use gym for injury prevention alone, that'll get you on the field more often than not. And Eilish, when you're when you're down to you know collective training with your with your team, would there be much on you know what is it less so you no know, long runs or or is it more you know do your runs by yourself and when you go into the collective training it's all fitness with the ball? Yeah, so it's pretty much do a lot of the running with the drill. Um, but at the end of the session, in pre season, there's always a lot of conditioning, and that always depends on how much we've actually covered on, you know, during training. So it's it's a lot easier to do run a session by encouraging you on, or someone to try and beat, or someone to try and catch, whatever it is. You know, it's easier to engage there at where you are. Very hard to work in the clock than your only, um, you know, competitor. When you have your teammates around the gym, it makes it a hell of a, hell of a lot easier because you know, they're great to encourage and they're pushing. You. They're all going through the same pain and it is pain, but um, you know, 
the more you achieve together, the more you will achieve together. So, um, yeah, collectively running in the last year has been just a lot better. And Emer, what would your um, sort of training camp week sort of look like? So, at the moment, obviously, we're in off season. So, we're technically pre season ahead of our rhythm qualifiers in October if they still go ahead. So, we're just aiming for it back. So, we have. We train five days and then we have two off days. So today is Monday. We had a total body conditioning session. Tomorrow is Tuesday, so we've got our mass runs. Tomorrow so that's our long runs. Um, Wednesday is a circuit and a total an upper body session. Thursday is off. Friday's run and Saturday's run, but the runs are different. So Saturday we focus on our speed and our sprints and our plows. Um, and then Sunday is off. So there's huge variety in our sessions between total body, upper body, circuit, mass runs, and then our sprints and our trials. So we kind of focus on everything. Um, but I'm really just trying to focus on stuff that I've done and bad at. So I work on stuff that I need to get better at. So obviously as a, as a fullback, you want to be like explosive and fast. So I'm working a lot on my sprints and plyometrics. And, and then I got my brother to, we got our brother to make us a big box so we can jump up and work on our step ups and work on our like box jumps to work on those trials. And I've been working on my shoulder ability so I have really bad shoulder ability. So I think you really need time to, to like work on the things that you really need to work on as well. Um, because you have the time to do it. Like normally you're rushing from place to place, but you have the time to work on those little things to make you better for, for the next season. Yeah, so we have. Go on ahead, In terms of like your training week, so it's pretty similar. Like, three run sessions a week and then blocked with four gym sessions a week and then stay off. So in the individual stuff is described, but can be quite hard to follow. Yeah. Um, we're under, you wouldn't be happy to know that if they're happy or sad, but um, we're under our last question and it's sent in from um, Grania Phillips over in New York. Um, so it's just wondering, you know, during, during isolation or the current climate, how do you stay motivated? Great question, Grania. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I personally am a huge fan of lifts, so I have to set like a target that I do during the day. So like on my list, it could be like just have breakfast, have lunch, have coffee, but I also have like go for a walk and um, do the do a run. So like I write down what I'm going to do and then you can just pick them up. And I think it's so easy to just like let the day go by and not do anything. And it's seven o'clock comes and you're like, oh, that's done enough today. So I'm a huge fan of writing stuff down and like, being specific with what you do as well. So whether it's, I'm going to run a 5 so then you will do your 5K, or I'm going to run 10, 100 meters, and then you are accountable for those 10 to be up and written down. So I feel like if you write stuff down, um, there's such satisfaction at the end of the day that you can actually keep them up and say, yeah, I did that, I did that, I did that. That would be my goal. That's how I'm keeping sane throughout all this is by creating lists and just picking them up at the end of the day. Yeah, so I would have been pretty similar as well, just tracking what I would like to do each day and also having a dinner and a weekly plan. So kind of just know that my running sessions are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and knowing that my you know my lower body gym is on a Monday and over on a Tuesday. On Wednesday I'll do a full body, on Thursday I'll have a break, Friday I'll do just knowing my structure for the week is something that makes it a hell of a lot easier to follow and you know something to kind of look forward to each day and just know what day it is because of oh, all my own sessions to do today it must be Monday or I'm a gym I'm up for gym today so it must be Tuesday so like just having a kind of a rough guide and a plan and I think another thing just like setting yourself a little goal like like Emer kind of touched on it previously like working on your weaknesses like you can get very much caught up in a team environment and team training and everything that goes with that kind of sometimes you forget about the things that you personally need to work on like your weaknesses or things that you feel you need to improve to make yourself better for the team and that can be kind of missed when you're in season because if it's a weight loss goal or a missing goal that you're trying to do you don't really want to change your routine while you're in season or in training with the rest of the team so i think i definitely use this time to um work on my body and, and my fitness a bit better and work on your body capacity and, and definitely, you know, single weight stuff and things like that that will help me next season and throughout the season and for my own career. So having like set goals that, you know, 
makes you a better player or makes you a better performer or whatever it is. It's definitely something that has helped me um, have a focus, which, which is good. So, because normally I can be a little bit kind of company go do, um, kind of go with the flow kind of thing. So, having a kind of a, a rough plan and a rough um, goal of set is something that really works for me. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, Eilish and um, Imer, you've been absolutely both fantastic here um, here tonight um, or this evening if you're, you're listening in New York um, or this afternoon, sorry. Um, you've been very, very great wealth of knowledge, very, very insightful and it's great to, to relate things back from other sports into the GA just to sort of, you know, pick up something new or um, think of something a little bit differently. Um, so hopefully uh, um, people listening in has, has took one or two things away. Um, I know I definitely, definitely have. So um, just again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your, out of your evening to, to come on and answer a few questions for us. And hope, hopefully this little collage there just of all the, um, the FINA pictures. Um, just gonna, I'm gonna click in here, see if we have any questions, folks, just before we... No questions. Nope, no questions. Um, so, folks, that's um, that's it for us. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in again. The the questions um, and the the level of interest was what make these webinars um, valuable. So, um, thank you for tuning in. And thank you for your questions. And again, Eilish and Emer, you know, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Just gonna, just gonna stop the recording. Sorry, what did you say?